I'm very concerned that pets is going to become synonymous with big technology. Smaller players, I think, have a much more resonating message to say, we actually do care about your privacy. How do we democratize um, tools and knowledge in a way that people and communities are empowered to take these for themselves? Hello, everyone. I'm Sergio Maldonado, and this is Masters of Privacy, a set of interviews covering the intersection of marketing, data, privacy, and technology with a clear goal in mind, which is redefining the relationship between people, brands, and media around transparency and control, which is to say we're aiming for real customer centricity, or if you will, human centricity. We regularly talk to DPOs, CMOs, CDOs and whoever else we find interesting and able to share valuable insights. So we hope you like it. Please do reach out if you have any ideas on future topics or speakers. We have Catherine Jarmul here with us today. She's a privacy activist and a data scientist, very focused on privacy and security in data science workflows. She's a principal data scientist at ThoughtWorks in Germany and has worked at various companies in the US and Germany before that. She's also a frequent keynote speaker at software and AI conferences, and that is in fact how we met at the Ethics and E-commerce Summit in London. Um, Catherine has recently published a book, and it's called Practical Data Privacy. It's published by O'Reilly. Um, in the book, which is widely available and to which we have added a link in our show notes, she has answered a few key questions, such as, how can we actually anonymize data? How does federated learning work? Can we already leverage homomorphic encryption? So one of the privacy enhancing technologies. Uh, to run analysis, for example, work with data even while it is encrypted? How can we compare and pick the most appropriate privacy-enhancing technology or PET? Um, how can we use open source libraries and more? So I have asked uh, Catherine to help us bring PETs, again, privacy-enhancing technologies, down to earth. And I believe she has succeeded. Let's get on with it. So, Catherine, thanks for coming. Thank you so much for having me. You said something at the ECA conference in London um, which stuck, which is that the people that are leveraging pets, privacy-enhancing technologies these days, tend to be the larger players, the Googles and, and Metas and so on, I understood. How do you see that? Over time, do you think that will be the case and we're going to be in the hands of the large players and smaller startups will need them to pave the ground? Or do you believe it's going to even out and it won't have such a competitive impact? Yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned it because I'm really concerned about it. And I think maybe this is something you share my concerns. Um I'm very concerned that pets is going to become synonymous with big technology and that only the big tech companies will be the ones that have deployed these at scale, that know how to use them, that they've been experimenting and honestly researching, contributing great research to the space for many years. But it's it could potentially be used, and we could maybe even argue it already is being used, as a vector to monopolize certain parts of consumer-facing data. And one could argue that the lobbying influence of CCPA in California, for example, where very specific ways of wording so that specific types of consent processing, data processing, um, pets, technologies, and so forth are perceived as better than other types of processing um, for, from a privacy aspect. We could argue, you know, we could argue where consumer data is most protected and we're not probably for many hours. But my fear is that this lobbying influence of privacy regulation 
um, by large technology companies is going to create an environment where smaller companies that don't position now to enable pets are going to be severely disadvantaged at not only a local scale, but at a global scale. And that's a big concern that I have. Good. Because then if we zoom out a little bit, before pets, you need to care. Yeah. Right. There's going to be. <laughs> yeah. You have to be motivated. So, exactly. So there's going to be, if you look at a startup, for example, so a startup, maybe they do worry and they start with that mindset. Oh, I need to know that there's going to be different people. We may discriminate. We want to show transparency, control all of these pieces. We understand them. But the money that we have compared to the budget that a Google will have to hire privacy engineers means that we are looking at, you know, hashing data and things that people have been doing for, you know, 20 years. Whereas the best people out there that we know, or maybe, you know, they want to get excited in their jobs. So they want to do things that are the, at the cutting edge. And they get not only that entertainment and enjoyment and learning experience, but also more money. So if the best people are working with like the best federated learning, you know, tools and exploring, you know, all of these things that we keep seeing in the Google Cloud and in like even the privacy sandbox in the marketing space. And in fact, that's a very good example. In the marketing space, all of these publishers and small ad tech companies they are still dealing with cookies because that's all they know. And we know they're really a challenge from a privacy point of view. But Google is already, you know, far, far ahead with topics API, distributed, uh, you know, interests and topics on, on every individual's browser. And so I guess there's, there's two ways. One is that maybe this becomes commoditized to the point that you do not need so much money or such teams to be able to to go as far to be as sophisticated or maybe that people are able to I don't know to have some tools on the on the individual let's say that control gets to such level that we do not need the company itself to do it for us I don't know I'm rumbling what do you think <laughs> I mean, I, I think it could go any number of ways. So one of the things, uh, so I, I recently published a book, uh, Practical Data Privacy. One of the reasons why I published that book is I wanted uh, to demystify pets for a technical audience. So just to be clear, the book is for a technical audience, but it's not uh, specifically when we see things like privacy engineering, which I would say is like the field of pets as part of privacy engineering. Um, Right now, it's kind of owned by experts who have studied cryptography or who have studied differential privacy or, as you talk about, study federated learning. And it's a very small expert group that kind of owns those topics. But I don't think that the knowledge needs to be owned like that. Just like we see machine learning today is not only from five companies. It doesn't have to be that privacy engineering is also only from five companies. And one of the things that I think we talked about that was also really inspiring at the conference was the idea that smaller players, I think, have a much more resonating message to say, we actually do care about your privacy. We're not just here to tell you, yeah, we did these five things. Don't worry. Don't trust us. You know, um, we're going to be, it's going to be fine. There's actually a relationship with your customer when you're smaller. There's an understanding of what customers are looking for. There's an understanding when you're operating in mid-sized e-commerce or smaller spaces in e-commerce. There's that that relationship that you have. And at the end of the day, privacy is about trust and the other way around. And so you don't have to have the coolest research group for pets to say, guess what? You know what? We decided to change these things about how our product works because we hope that it's going to give you more choices. And we're going to show you how we're building stuff. And we're going to hope that you trust us more and that therefore you choose us versus maybe the most mainstream or easy way um, to do that or just buying a thing from the largest e-retailer or something like this. And I think... I think that there is a steadily growing market for that type of relationship with your customers, whether it be B2B or B2C. 
True. So I guess the fact that we as consumers start appreciating because we understand the risks and we can see the difference. We start appreciating as, yes, during the conference, we were comparing that with environmental protection and, and a company standing in that space. So then if we look at startups that have these things in mind as they start, as they, as they get started with the development of technologies, why is it that, and I'm wondering, of course, I have not, I'm asking you, right? Uh, so why is it that we have seen the largest breakthroughs in terms of technology happened before we even cared about things like privacy or data ethics? And is there an angle? Because now it's very easy to say, I mean, we look at things like Google, right? There was uh, Susanna Zuboff right? The surveillance um, capitalism. So she was talking about the data exhaust in the, in the Google world. Okay, nobody realized we had this data here, let's use it. Then uh, ChatGPT, uh, Italy, so all of these things. Why is it that a company with so many resources, right? With such resources, they take so long to realize, but at the same time, is it maybe trying to be sort of play the devil's advocate? The fact that they didn't care about all of the possible consequences, not just ethical, but everything. The fact that they accepted that certain variables would not be solved at the outset, is it that that creates real breakthroughs? Whereas maybe from a European perspective, we keep boasting of our ability to see further in terms of ethics and so on. But then maybe we're trying to get everything so nailed that there's no innovation because we believe everything has to be properly, not just in terms of ethics, as a cultural concept, right? That you need to be to solve all of the variables before you even throw anything out there. There's that dilemma. What do you think about that crazy dilemma? I think uh, I, it's really interesting. I haven't I haven't framed it in my head exactly that way before, but I will tell you how I framed it in my head. So I'm originally from California. I've lived in Germany now for nine years. Obviously, very different concepts of technology, very different concepts of uh, the sensitive data, personal data, and so forth. Um, and one thing that I do think that has helped the California-based companies is the ability to navigate risk. Yes. And one of the things that I see, and I can only speak from a Germany context here, is is there's a very good assessment of risk. In fact, there's, I think in Europe generally, as you reference, there's a much better assessment of the ethical risk at hand, of the privacy risk at hand. So you can uh, we can assess risk better here. But once risk is assessed, it is often a lack of connection to figure out how do we navigate this risk in a way where the business is still encouraged to do things. And uh, I have an article that I, I haven't published yet. It's in German and it's called um, Datenschutz aus Wissen statt Angst. And so if you speak German, you may understand it, but it means data privacy out of knowledge instead of fear. And I think that one of the things that I see as important in my work and that I know that a lot of my peers in Europe also see is how do we empower? So we have this understanding of risk. How do we empower ways to navigate risk that are safe, that are human centric, that are human rights centric, um, but still allow for amazing technologies like machine learning to be used when they're important? And I wish Europe was leading um, the quote unquote AI race because I believe that machine learning can be human rights centric. But I think most of what we see today is not human rights centric because it's not being pushed forward by how do we solve the most pressing world problems right now by using, uh, not, not technology won't solve it, but by using tools like machine learning to help humans, policymakers, um, and so forth, make interesting decisions. And I do, I do think there's also numerous people across the world that have that same goal. Um, so I think that it doesn't have to be European-led, but I do think that this idea of human rights-based data 
um, is something that Europe has constantly been a leader in and something that I think will continue. Then uh, books such as your book help because in the end you are propagating the culture, right, amongst data scientists and then they understand a practical way to do it. A practical, it's not just, because there's always this, this thing with privacy in the frame of, there's always, when we talk about privacy, for example, in machine learning, then very quickly we jump into ethics to go beyond the law and to sort of, to say what's behind the law. It's not just about enforcement, it's rather the carrot rather than the stick. And if we look at ethics, then it's a very slippery slope as well, because then ethics, and we discussed that the other day during the, the uh, in, a, in a chat, I had a chat with uh, Catherine King after this, uh, after the event as well, on the subjective or objective nature of ethics, which has been going on, this dilemma is like centuries old. But if we go into ethics, then it gets, it could get very political very fast. Maybe together with your ethics, you ship in a particular political stand Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> it's very, and and it's very delicate. Yeah, yeah. And from a data point yeah. of view, we have to think about um, the we have to think about the democratization of the type of data that we use. So it's commonly known that a lot of the biases that are found in generative AI models and so forth are extremely US centric. When they're not US centric, they're extremely Northwest Europe centric. And what does that mean? How does that represent the needs of AI users in Central Africa? How does it represent AI users um, in, in the Uga region? How does it represent AI users in totally different geographies with totally different cultural understanding, even of words and language and uh, what those mean? And so I think one of the goals that I've had in all of my work in machine learning is how do we democratize um, tools and knowledge in a way that people and communities are empowered to take these for themselves. And I think, you know, ethics at, at, a, glo at a global or a, a human rights sense is about, you know, allowing people to define what they think of as a just world. Um, and yes, therefore, it does get contentious because we can live two streets away and have very different views of what a just world looks like. <laughs> but um, exactly. if, if both of us have equal access to knowledge and tools, potentially, I guess what we can argue from a democratic society point of view is that eventually that plays out for the better of society via some sort of, of communal and, or, you know congressional type of understanding across the many different viewpoints. I guess that would be the goal. It's good. I mean, in the end, even the law, right, even the law has fundamental rights sitting behind. So there's always going to be something. This is going to be that layer where we do have, we do need some common beliefs and they, yeah. What's exciting to you these days in terms of the technologies that you see, not just come in far ahead, but maybe things that everybody could leverage, perhaps by even looking at your book. What's exciting to you these days? Yeah, I think it's a really awesome space for that. I fundamentally, this is something that I say also at a lot of machine learning conferences, I think that the way that we do data sharing today, no matter what scale you're doing in that, is going to fundamentally change in the next five to 10 years. Because the technologies that are available now, I know uh, numerous of your listeners probably know now a lot about federated analytics and federated learning. Um, there's also the, the field that I come from is called encrypted learning or encrypted analytics, where we're doing the same type as federated, but we're actually doing it all on encrypted data without ever decrypting it. Um, the, these technologies are at the level now where they're going to be taking out of research labs and they're put into production systems. And that's, for example, a lot of how um, Google Ads gets the extra knowledge is by using encrypted analytics processing to match, let's say, for example, credit card data or purchasing data with user profiles. And so this is how we can enhance data. We can enhance data sharing relationships, but we can still be compliant in the ways that we do it because we're either doing it in a federated sense or we're doing it in a federated and encrypted sense and any combination of these things. And the book spends several chapters on this. In fact, an exact use case is 
um, is two folks uh, in the e-commerce space sharing data to try to find customer segments that they find interesting for potentially launching a new product line or collaboration or something like this. There's even an example code note notebook for if you have if you have data people on your team, you can show them it. But I think that the old way of, of sharing data where you sign a, a contract and you send the data over and you hope and you make sure that the other person hopefully is compliant, I think those days will eventually subside and will, but I think that's great. I think that actually creates some competitive advantage where you can then have different types of data sharing agreements with different um competitors, partners, other people in this space, because you can actually guarantee from the technical side that the agreement is actually enforced. And I think that this could actually really empower um, groups of folks to come together and create very powerful collective data sharing partnerships that also give the users guarantees. True. And the one struggle that we keep hearing from DPOs is auditing vendors. There's so many data processors that are below the radar because you've got every department, especially in the marketing space, you've got marketing departments adding pixels and tags to every digital property, you know, mobile apps, websites, and it's so hard to, to understand what's going on. And in the end, auditing, processing DPAs, if there's standard contract clauses for data transfers, it gets really hard. So if you get rid of this because there's no data, you know, there's no chain of custody of all of these. Yeah, yeah, it makes all the sense. I guess the extreme then, to take it to a last question about this, sort of taking everything to the very extreme of, of lowering the risk, decentralization, people in control. We keep talking and we've had so many debates about this, about always the same final idea, people in control of their identity and their data. We always end up landing in the same place. And if, if, uh, how do you see that playing out, given that the biggest obstacle that we see, and you've been doing lots of tests and, and you did even show some ideas in, in practice in terms of consent gathering and so on. Do you see or have you found a way to break the convenience barrier with people when it comes to control? I think actually um, one of the things I recently referenced, I was recently at the EU Privacy Forum where a lot of the regulatory authorities in Europe meet together to talk about privacy. And I gave a little bit of a his history walk through privacy engineering. And I like to tell people that the original co cookie specification was actually GDPR compliant. So I like, to, I like to point out, and there's actually a ton of really cool research. If you start looking at the 90s, this is, yeah, going back a long time, I know. But if you look at some of the research on privacy by design in the 90s, there was all these ways where people were testing ideas of um, learning how people like to share data on their phones, learning how people like to show da share data in their browser, and trying to, there was this strong connection between the user experience community and the privacy community. And a lot of those efforts died. We can all surmise many of the different reasons. It also could just be, you know, the browser wars and, and those things happening the way they did. But I think that that's what we need now. Again, we need to go back to having user experience and product experts working directly with privacy experts. So directly, if you're on legal and you're a DPO, you should be sitting there with the UX team and thinking through how do people actually want to go through this? Like what questions do we want to ask them? And depending on your market segment, your customer segment and so forth, they might have a really different understanding than what they're currently being presented. And if you can make people happy if you can give people joy in using your technology, you're going to continue building that trust. If you continue building that trust, there's going to be much more of a chance that the, not only will the consumer stay with you, your customers now have a relationship with you, but B, the, they're going to be willing and able to offer more of their data, more of their understanding um, because of that trust. And I think that's a differentiator in a huge way. 
That's very encouraging, and that's a that's a great way to finish this. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, that's all for today. And you will find some episode notes and links to our social channels on mastersofprivacy.com. Thank you for listening.